for the place where we are at, I'm so thankful because the, the Bible says it's not through power nor through might, but it's through spirit. Amen. We're not going to win this fight because we are so fancy and so great and because we've got everything figured out. Danielian. It's not because we are so awesome that things are going to happen. It's going to happen because Jesus said it's finished. And because we've believed him, it would be counted to us as righteousness. Amen. So this morning I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue with the Holy Spirit, but I'm going to continue with him this morning in the New Testament. And um, I asked the Lord for, for next year, I said, Lord, um, what do you want us to focus on? How, how are we going to do this thing? I mean, because we're at full capacity at ARC, and I'm not sure how we're going to do everything, and how we're going to walk on the water, and how, Lord, how are you going to provide? And I'm, I'm one of those guys that I want answers for the questions. Who, who's like that? You, you want to know that you know? You don't want to just gesture or think that we're going into a, a direction. And the Lord said to me, just follow the, the flow of my spirit. And then one night I was sitting and I, I was spending time with the Lord and I experienced the Lord said that we're going to roll up our sleeves. So we're going to start with a campaign next year. We're going to kick off early in January, which we're going to challenge. The, the challenge, guys, I want to challenge the church before I challenge the world. I want to challenge the people in our midst to have a day, even if you have to put in vacation. And I want to challenge you to come and roll up your sleeves. Pitch up with your nice bootsies and your squinkies and your nice, your little black dress and come and build with us at Ark. Roll back your sleeves is literally going to mean that I'm calling the church and the corporate world to come and say, Lord, we're going to roll up our sleeves and we're going to build up from the bottom and we're going to trust the Lord for, for breakthrough. And what I would love you to do is to go back to your workplace, go back, I mean, Elaine, you have to hear us, and I pray with them, and say, we're going to roll back our sleeves. It's very important for us to get the message out there, okay? I'm not very good on social media, you'll hardly get me on there, but I'm going to ask you guys, please, ha has hashtag and do all those things that you have to do, roll back your sleeves, Acts 29. And the reason for that is that I, I trust that if we can get the corporate world to come and build with our, our guys, to come and mix dago with them the whole day, sleep in their beds, eat their food. We're going we're gonna to get people that says, listen, yeah, we have met such awesome people. They're going to speak about encounters that they've had. That's one of the things that we want to do. Roll back our sleeves are also going to mean that, that we want to clean up the streets. I'm trusting the Lord that we'll have a movement that says, Lord, we're going to go out. So I want to call certain, on, on Monday we will speak over certain outreach, local outreaches, for those who can't do international outreaches, where we will go to Malchasiedek and places like that. And I, I trust the Lord that the church, and more than that, that some of the corporates is going to come in and buy in and say, listen, here, we're going there. Uh, Marie wants to go with my wife and a few other girls to, to the brothels. And we want to go, who's in? Okay. I think, guys, it's, it's, it's about time that we're going to be relevant and let's, let's hit the places where the darkness is the most. The Bible says there where the light is, the darkness can't penetrate. Amen? So we only need to be present. But we're so scared that we'll become intoxicated and we'll fall. And don't, remember, don't forget, we never need to be arrogant and think that out of our flesh it does good. If you do it in an accountability way and you are transparent and you're doing it with meaning, I believe that the Lord's going to bless it. I don't think it's something you need to go and do on your own in the dark, which nobody knows about. That means you're just busy creating for yourself a problem. Okay? Can I get an amen? amen? Okay. What I do believe is, is I believe that the Lord is calling the church to be relevant. I believe that we are still the light. I believe that we are the salt of the earth. I believe that the Lord wants us to not only come to the water, but jump in the waters. Amen? Um, I think before I start, I just want to celebrate. Dennis, welcome. It's your first time here, am I right? Just stand up. Let's give him a hand. He's from Ark. JP Stonop, it's your first time here. Let's give, give JP a hand. The rest of the guys we are acquainted with, I think, uh, Esmeralda, Christopher, stand your phone, so. That is Michaela's bro uh, biological brother and sister. Let's just give them a hand. They're visiting us the weekend. Uh, you're welcome to sit. Um, I just want to think, is there anyone else that I've missed out now? Uh, Brian, low, <laughs> hallelujah. <laughs> oh, stock. Oh, stock. Uh, uh, hello, please stand up. Let's just give a hand. What's your name, Mama? Welcome. We, thank you, Vincent. You bring your whole team. 
Hey, the Lord will look after the building. Don't worry, we'll be fine. <laughs> okay, amen. So, um, as, as we're jumping into this, I really, I've got a yearning in my heart, and I hear the Father's cry for a people who is far. And unless we tap into the Father's heart, we'll always miss out on something that is beautiful to Him. God had not come for, the, for those who are healthy. The Bible says He came for the sick. And there's a, there's a shout in His heart to ask people who will get out of their comfort. Who will be so uncomfortable to chase down my presence and be part of this movement that He is calling. And guys, it's not calling it into the church, into this church specific. He's calling it everywhere. And only those who respond will get, get, get part of it. I believe that many people are going to heaven and they've done nothing. They're going to stand in front of the Lord and He's going to say, so what have you done? He's going to take account of our lives. I want to tell you, it doesn't matter. If you're comfortable with just giving money, I want to say to you, that's the last thing that, that impresses God. God was sitting in the temple looking at the, the, the financial box. And So by the way, He was sitting, if you have to look where God is sitting, He's sitting right next to the money box. <laughs> he's a typical Jew. And it's not because, he's not because he's, he's, um, he is crazy or that He's obsessed with money. Is That's where He really sees people's hearts. Have we already taken up the offering? Okay, so we are finished. Okay, so who wants to give again? <laughs> okay, so... Um, I believe that there is something that God wants to do, and it's not a money thing. It's a heart thing. It's the circumcision of the heart saying, Lord, here am I, send me. It's the old ancient cry, the ancient path, which the prophet said, when God was shouting over the earth, he said, and whom shall I send? Whom shall go? And he replied, he said, here am I, Lord, send me. Before he could think, he responded. It's like when you are so into somebody, and when they speak, the next moment you get yourself in the crowd, yay! And everyone is like, Kirik, what the hell's wrong with you? This guy responded, and he said, here am I, Lord. And all of a sudden, he was confronted by his own actions. He said, Lord, but I'm unpure. I'm not usable. It's interesting that no one usable was raising their hands. It was, it's very obvious that there was no one there who was so qualified that they could say, well, I'm qualified to go. It was interesting that it was the guy that was falling in his words that God said, well, I will use him and I'll send him. And guys, I've not seen it once. I've seen it many times. Throughout the Bible, it speaks about stories. Billiam and his donkey on his way. And Billiam is not getting into what God wants him to do. So the next moment, the donkey speaks to Billiam. Who's ever thought that a donkey can speak to you? It's like your Italian greyhound sitting on your couch telling you, listen, you need to get, roll back your sleeves, brother. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> is it war, <worth>, Frank? <laughs> what I believe with my whole heart is that God's going to make the church so uncomfortable and I believe we're going to be blessed. I don't believe we're going to be poorer. I don't think it's a forceful thing because it's not, it's not God likes people that approve, that says, Lord, I want to go. But I believe that there is especially in this crowd, a majority of people saying, Lord, we hunger and thirst for your righteousness. Ephesians 1.13, I'm starting where I ended last week. Ephesians 1.13 says, In him also when you heard the word of truth. So when you heard this word, that, who's the truth, the way, and the life? Who knows that the Bible is always speaking about a person. Everything is for him, to him, and about him. There's nothing that you read inside the word that does not that's not a, a, a typology, what's it in English? A typology of, of who Jesus is. Okay? And it's very important for you to understand that Jesus will always be the truth. Facts change, the truth never change. You can write that down. Facts was 200 years ago, there was nothing that could drive faster than 60 kilometers an hour. Today you can drive 300 kilometers an hour. That's facts. Facts was 500 years ago, no one went to the moon. These, today, every second week, someone is going to the moon. That's fact. But the truth is throughout the ages, it's always the same. And that's why Jesus didn't, isn't factual. He's the truth. He's never convincing people by facts. He's telling them and, and saying that he's the truth. And that offends some people because who do you, how do you think you are to call yourself the truth? The son of God. God's beloved son. He's made himself equal with God by forgiving people's sins. What type of guy we are speaking about? Listen here, 
the gospel, so when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, the good news that Jesus saved you by the cross, and there's nothing that you can do or contribute to that that can get you into heaven. When you believe that it was done through only the works of Jesus and he only paid the price and you, you, you came into that belief system, all of a sudden we see that God comes and um, he brings salvation to people on the basis of their belief system. Amen? It's not based Ephesians, Galatians. It's in the, the, James says, if I look at your works, I can exactly tell you where your heart is. If I look at your actions, I can see where your heart is. But it's very clear that no one gets saved on the base of their actions. That's not what saves you. That just tells us what's the fruit that's in your life. Amen? And believed in him, were sealed with the promise, Holy Spirit, thank you, God. Just say to the person next to you, thank you, God, I'm sealed with the promise, Holy Spirit. The reason why you're still alive is because you've got the ecclesia of God, or the, the parakletos of God inside of you. Amen? You've got his spirit. Who's thankful for his spirit? Okay. We don't really know what we have. The church has made the spirit something that makes us feel good, makes us fall down, makes us um, get victory from time to time. We've not understand that he's a person. It's the spirit of Jesus that is alive and active in us and through us. And it's proactive day and night. Amen. That I will be your pillar of fire at night and your cloud during the day. You never need to be afraid when you've got the Spirit of God within you. You never have to feel insecure in your life again. You never have to wonder if God is going to be faithful. What a promise. So Lord, I don't understand what I'm going through, but I'm praising you in any case because I know that you are more in control than I can be. I can't see it yet, but you don't need to see it so that God will do it. Amen? Because it's his faithfulness, am I right? And the Bible says, when you got sealed with this spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So the one thing that we have, once we believed in Jesus Christ and we've received his spirit, and you are sealed with the spirit, then you've got a guarantee that you're going to heaven. Isn't is it like any? That takes the pressure of performing out of the whole thing. My vrou, my vrou hoef nie te weet, sy moet kan bak en altwerk doen, so dat ek al trou nie. So wie is dit te verlichten? Who of you, when you got married, your, your mother-in-law had this high expectation on you, that you must be able to sew, ek kan blijf wees, ek sê het in Engels, <laughs> that you can sew, and bake, and brew, and make food, and you had this high expectation, all that you wanted to do is, maybe just going to business. The nice thing about God is, is that he's, He places no expectation on you except that you are in Christ and Christ in, is in you. What a mighty God we serve. Isn't that an awesome testimony? I want to tell you this liberated me. Once I understood this, that there's nothing that I can do to please God more. God's not more impressed with me because I read Bible this morning. Does it please God? Of course. Is it pleasing to Him when we do the right thing, when we give to the poor? Yes, but that's not what gets us into heaven. That's just an effect of what we believe that is manifested because we believe. And that's why I tell you, whenever you walk out on the water, the way that you walk, I'll tell you exactly what you believe. The way that I conduct myself on the outside will tell my wife exactly how much I love her. Not what I tell her, what I do. That will communicate that you are loved. Amen? John 16 verse 4 says, and this is Jesus speaking. Now remember, we've got a flow of, of the, the whole book of John is this, this miracle book. If you haven't read it, please do read it in December. It is officially the last book written. People don't know this. They thought the book of Revelation was the last book written. No, the book of John was written after the book of Revelations. The book of John was, remember everyone thought that Jesus was coming back while John was alive because Jesus said to him, you will not die before I come back. That's what they understood. So he never thought for himself it would be necessary to write an account. And then the church fathers came to him and they pleaded with him, will you please give us your account? And that's why his version, he said, I've read the other three version, versions, very great. But they've not placed it into context of love. And John is the beloved disciple. It's, he's, he's the one writing from the point of view of the son that is beloved. 
There was a difference in the actions of Joseph, who knew he was beloved, opposed to the rest of the sons who didn't know that they were beloved. Because the father just loved him. He made him this very nice. So John was beloved. And if you read the book of John, and especially from 11 up to 17, where it comes to the high priestly prayer, going into to the whole crucifixion of Jesus, it brings, it, it, it eliminates the goodness and the kindness of God. But here Jesus is speaking, and he's specifically speaking on the topic of the Holy Spirit. And he says, I'm telling you this now. It's Jesus speaking. So that when the, the times come, you will remember that I foretold it. So I am prophesying now to you, and I'm telling you what's going to, I'm, pre, I'm predicting the future. I am creating the future. And listen what he's saying. I didn't tell you that this is the beginning because, it was still, because I was still with you. But now that I'm about to leave you and go back and join the one who sent me, you need to be told, yet no, not one of you are asking me where I'm going. Instead, your hearts are filled with sadness because I've told you these things. So all of a sudden, we get the emotions that Jesus is picking up of the disciples. And what he's picking up of them is that they are really sad because their beloved Jesus is saying that he's going away. And they feel excluded. Who's, I remember being a young Christian and one of my biggest desires was that I want to see Jesus physically. And then I realized that one of the promises in the word is that you will see him one day. But I've never seen Jesus in my lifetime. I've never had an encounter with him sitting on his lap. Neville tells how he sat on his lap. You get specific people that get that opportunities. I've never had that. But I know my baby girl's been on his lap. And listen here, instead your hearts are filled with sadness because of what? Because I've told you these things. Because I said to you, I'm not going to be with you. I'm going to my father. You are growing weary in your hearts. Listen now. But, say to the guy next to you. But is that what you tell your girlfriend before you break up with her? Okay? Ja is die mooiste ding. Jy is die oulikste. Jy is die vriendlikste ding. I've loved you so much, man. I want to go to Kilimanjaro and climb that mountain for you. But. But means forget everything that I've just said. Focus on what's coming now. That's what but means. But's really the intention. What I can tell you, man, you're the most beautiful girl. Maria, I like you and Alice. And you're the best thing and I love your food, man. But. Then you know, okay, right now I'm going to really say what I mean. Okay? That's what it means. But here's the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away. The church does not want to believe. We want Jesus here. And Jesus is saying, it is in your favor that I'm not here. He's making a statement. Remember when he came as God, he was the son of God. He became flesh. He became man. But he did not count himself equal with God. He did not come, even though he was God, he did not move as God. He moved as man. He did what man could do who believes. Amen. He was 100% God, but he was giving himself to operate as a 100% man. God reincarnated. Amen? Okay, are you with me? It is to your advantage that I go away. Why? Because when you are a man, you are singular. Jesus was not omnipotent. He was not omnipresent. He was not everywhere. He was, he was um, in one place at one time. He could not be in everyone. He could only touch a limited amount of people at that stage. And everyone who came around him experienced healing and love and breakthrough. Amen? For if I do not go away, the divine encourager will not be released to you. And your translation will say the Holy Spirit. Okay? Or the comforter will not be released to you, but after I depart, I will send him to you. So what we see now is Jesus being very clear in the New Testament. He says, for me to go away means that the Holy Spirit, my spirit, will come and stay. And that's the spirit will, that will never leave nor forsake you. Emmanuel, God with us. It's not only God walking with some of us. It is the indwelling presence of God that we get sealed with. And it can't be taken away from you. Uh, guys, this is the best news that you can get. 
Getting children is not such great news as getting this news. The best news is that God will never, ever not be with you. So I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will expose sin and prove that the world is wrong. So the whole thing, what the, the Spirit of God does, is he does not convict us of sin. In your translation, it should read that he's going to convict the world of sin, the church of righteousness. Amen. So what the Spirit does, it tells you every time that you fail, but the price has been paid. It tells you, do not look at your fault and keep continuing in the problem. Stand up and know what's the price that's been paid for you and walk away from that. You can't stay like a dog at your puke, eating your puke all the time. So he wants you to get up and to move metanoia into a different direction because of your belief system. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so he will be. You will only be what you think. And if you think God is out there to get you and he's against you and he's allowed circumstances to tremble you, then you've got a wrong belief system. Because the God I've seen, he's never done wrong. He said there's no form of darkness within him, no shadow. His heart is for us, not against us. And the thoughts that he's got containing is, is thoughts of life. And even on your worst day, he's contemplating the best of you. He's never seen you in a position of death because your sin can't be seen through God. Because it was eradicated by the blood of Jesus. So people will tell me, so this gives me a reason to sin. No, this gives you an excuse to get out of sin. This gives you the very reason why you should not continue with what you were doing. Because you've got all the ability, grace is the supernatural gift of God. Where he enables you to get out of that which, to, which used to keep you down. Amen. Listen, yeah? And when he comes, he will expose sin and prove that the world is wrong about God's righteousness and his judgments. Sin because they refuse to believe in who I am. The only sin why people will be going to hell one day is the fact that they did not believe in Jesus Christ. Not because they were drunk, not because they smoked, not because they stole, not because they used drugs, not because they were gay. The only reason why people will not go into the heaven is for the one sin, not believing in Jesus Christ. And those who do it still. The best news, that's the gospel. Let's go back to the previous verse. The gospel of your salvation. In him also when you heard the word of truth, Jesus is the word, the gospel. The gospel is the good news that Jesus died and he paid the full sin on the cross. Am I right? The gospel is good news. You, you, you can't quote the gospel in a bad way. As soon as you get a message that is conflicting towards the gospel, and you get a but in it, you must know it's not Jesus. The gospel is where Jesus says, I've paid it all. I've, I've given you every excuse to make it. And now you can move out of everything. Let the adulterer say that I'm free. Let everyone who has sinned come to the conclusion that they've already been paid for. There's nothing that you can do that can separate you from the love of God. Amen? Let's look at verse 10. God's righteousness because I'm going back to join the Father and you will see me no longer. Only for now. So he's saying I'm having a reunion with my daddy. Amen? I want to tell you, one of these days, I will have a reunion with my daddy and my daddy and my, and my Lord and my Savior and my whole family and all my friends and all my church brothers and sisters. It's such a glorious, death is such a glorious thing. We've made it into this awkward thing. Guys, the most glorious thing you can ever go through is to lay this body down, down and to get to the one that you've loved, the lover of your soul. That's the reason why we're supposed to live. We make it sound as if it's bad. If I see people wanting not to age, age is one of the most beautiful things you can go through. The fact that I'm bald is beautiful. Amen? <laughs> Give the Lord a hand. Yeah, I'm secure in myself. Guys, I don't want to live forever. And I don't want to be forever young. Because there's wisdom in being gray. We, we've believed in lies instead of taking up the truth. I want to say to you, die grace kop da. Da, da. As says it's wisdom. God gives it, he calls it a crown. And yet we have failed to see the promises of God because the world has made us felt so insecure 
in not becoming or aging into the grace of God. Okay, but I'm not going to go into that. That's not the whole deal. Verse 11, and judgment because the ruler of this dark world has already received his sentence. The devil is already judged. If you think that Jesus is going to come back and he's going to have a war and we're waiting for Armageddon, I'm telling you, you might just have the wrong belief system. I don't believe that's going to happen. The Bible said Jesus only had to die once. He's already conquered the devil on the cross. So when Jesus got crucified, he got crucified before the foundations of the is that what the Bible says? So if he was crucified before the foundations of the earth, he can equally already have done and won and conquered the devil. It's just not happened in our time. So that's why we believe in Kairos time, which is God's time, and Kronos time, which is our time. Does it make sense? Okay. So I don't believe that in this huge fight that is coming, I believe when Jesus said it is finished, that it really was finished. I believe that when God spoke, everything into existence that Jesus when he said it is finished he cancelled everything else he won the battle it was concluded and the devil was already down he's done and out and he's scared to help so you know what you wonder it for him to bang with yes like you with bang with is your ear in the head in I was also I was actually done going on but I'm still for slow he's a no more this is one for the VIP to screen <laughs> verse 12 there is so much more i would like to say to you but it's more than you can grasp at this moment but when the truth giving spirit comes so now there's another promise the truth giving spirit when he comes he will unveil the reality of every truth within you so what the holy spirit does is he reveals the truth about you He's an identity giver. He's a comforter. He's a reinstater. He tells you all the time how great you are, how you will succeed when you don't have the answers and you fall back into the spirit. And that's why people don't understand why the gifts are so important. The gifts are important. And next week I'm going to preach on the gifts. It's because when you understand the gifts, the gifts is to, 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 to edify the body. But there's one gift that edifies you. It's so important that the church needs to realize what the Holy Spirit, because if you can get yourself understanding that God is speaking, and I'm not going to try and convince you about anything, the Holy Spirit needs to convince you. Amen? I don't want you to fall over, roll your back in your eyes. I want you to be in a place where you say, Daddy, come and fill me. Come and fill me. Lord, come and run me over. If you fall over, because this, if you never fall because someone pushes you. If you fall, if someone pushes you, you're a hypocrite. You're going to make other people disbelieve, and you're going to walk out saying God is not alive. Does God let people fall? Yes, he does. But not everyone. Don't follow the crowds. Do what God is doing. And be obedient to his spirit. If he makes you fall, you don't need anyone to catch you. Why would I catch you if God wants you to fall? I don't do ushers in the church. If you fall out of the flesh, please get hurt. Okay? I'll pray for healing afterwards. If you fall by the Spirit, I've seen people with back injuries falling by the Spirit, and when they got up, the back inju injury was healed. It's not through power nor through might. It's through His Holy Spirit. I tell you, we must stop playing games with the presence of God. He's real, and if He does something, we're not going to stand in His way. We're going to say, Lord, let your will be done. Okay? I've seen people fly in the air. Fall in the air. And it's like, it's like, it's like, but when the truth giving spirit comes he will unveil the reality of every truth within you he won't speak his own message the holy spirit doesn't have a message apart from the message of jesus he's only there to convict us of the truth, which is Jesus. That's what he does. He reminds you the whole day. He's done it. You can do it. You can do all things through Christ. It's just not, you know what Paul's doing? We used to, if, what's it, Philippians 4, verse 13, 16, where it says you can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens you. Everyone likes, I mean, I've seen rugby teams putting that on their jerseys. I thought to myself, if you just read the five verses before that, where it speaks about <laughs> through what Paul went and how he's been 
punished and crucified and worked through all hell and back. And then he makes a statement that you can do all things. He's not making that as this, you, can, you, you go, just do it. Nike. That's not what he's doing. He's telling you what he's just been through and the hell that he's gone through. And then he says, but you can do all things through Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. That's good news. <laughs> Listen here. He will glorify me on the earth for he will receive from me what is mine and reveal it to you. Everything that belongs to the Father belongs to me. That's why I say to the divine encourager will receive what is mine and reveal it to you. Acts 1 verse 8. So now we've got this whole disciples. Um, so by the way, everything that we read in the Bible up until the point where we get the crucifixion of Jesus is still called the Old Testament. You only have a testament once somebody passed away. So you had an old covenant, which is more accurately translated, and a new testament, because you can't have an old testament. It wasn't a testament, it was a covenant, which God made. And there is, um, in between, there's a few covenants. There was a covenant made to Adam, there was one made to Abraham, there was one made with Moses. Amen. There was one made to David. Noah. So there's covenants that's made. So we sit with an old covenant, and usually God says the following. I will do this, and then you do that. A covenant means you, it's like a marriage contract. A testament means that someone has died, and the good news is that you are the beneficiary, that something has come to you by grace. Who's glad? So let's look in now, remember, in the book of Acts, Acts 1 verse 8, but I promise you that the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you will be filled with power. I want to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address some thinking errors today concerning the Holy Spirit. So we see when the Spirit of God comes, He's going to give us power. It's not when you run on stage and jump through a paper and roll and, and, and scream that you've got power. The power that it's speaking about is in the first way to empower yourself. That's the power that you need when you're up and down and you're sitting in the room and you, you're calling it bipolar and you turn around to the cross and say, Lord, but this is what you're saying about me. It's when you change your confession. Van die mag van leven dood le in die mond, in die, in die, in die mond, en die wat het lief is met die gebruik, sal die vrucht al van pluk of van leven of van dood. Either you'll speak life or you will speak death. So the, the first thing is that the Holy Spirit, when it appeared on them, it was in the form of a tongue of fire. That's how the Bible describes it. A fiery tongue. Why? Because we need, that's the one thing. In, in James, it speaks that it's the smallest part of, in the body, but yet it determines your direction. That what you say, gaan jy? Hey. If you keep on speaking death over your situation, guess what? So I'd rather prophesy life over my wife. Ja, dan moet jy sê mooiste ding. 18 years later, the next week we'll be married 18 years. 18 years later, she's still the mooiste ding vir my in die wereld. In die Bible roep haar a ding. Hy sê wat a mooi ding gevind het. Ja, a good thing. She's a very good thing. That's when God didn't know what to call them yet, because that was the latest version. <laughs> I once tried and said, I said she was the latest virgin. <laughs> But I promise you this, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be filled with power and you will be my messenger to Jerusalem throughout Judea, distant provinces and even the remote places on earth. Right after he spoke these words, the, di the disciples saw Jesus lifted up into the sky and disappeared into the cloud. Now I'm going to make it real. Unfortunately, I want to confront you. I'm not convicting you of sin. I'm convicting you of righteousness now. Okay? I don't want you walking out here and say, yes, I feel condemned now that Matthias did said. I want you to, to allow this, the word to impact your spirit, and then you should say, Lord, am I this or am I not? And if I'm not, how can I be it? Because this is what you say about me. Is that right? Can we do it like that? Let's read this, this portion again. But I promise you this. It's a promise that Jesus is making now to his disciples. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and fill you with power. So the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Why? Because you've believed. 
and He will fill you with power. Power is giving you the ability to go through everything that you have gone through in life. That's why the Bible can say you've never been tempted beyond your own strength. There's nothing that you've gone through that you can't make. Lazan, what you've been through, you've been through Alan back, but you know what? It's still in his plan. It's going to work. Everything is going to work out for your good. Amen? Hear me out. We'll be filled with power, and here's the problem that I have with the church, is that it's not optional once you've received the spirit of power to become a messenger. It is obvious that you should become a messenger. We've made it that now certain people are called and certain people must speak. If you don't have the Holy Spirit and you don't talk, I doubt that you've really had an encounter with God. If you have nothing to say about His goodness and what He's done for you, then you are not a messenger. Amen? Whose messengers in here? Is there anyone that can relate to that? It's not to make you feel guilty. It's to, to activate the promise of God in you, over you, and for you. Listen here what it will do. And you will be my messenger, my witness in Jerusalem. It's the local place throughout Judea. Judea is the place next. When you lived in Pretoria and you are staying in Waverley, then you've got Waverley. Judea would be Eastland, Samaria, the, 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 the outskirts, Gauteng, to up until the end of the earth. India, Pakistan. And then some people will tell me, why do you go to India every year? Why don't you just preach locally? And I'll tell them, have you seen how much I do locally? I preach locally. I lead people to Jesus. I'm convicted. I'm in a local church. But it doesn't excuse me not to go out to the prostitute and to the person that's in, uh, afflicted on the street. And it doesn't stop me from going in my area and changing the lives of people that's going, the farmers that's going through drought or whatever they are working through. It doesn't excuse me not to go to India, Pakistan, Zimbabwe and all those places. And I want to tell you, the, the two, two thirds of God's name is go. Um, you can't take the go out of the gospel. And if you really want to be relevant in the time that we live, you need to say, Lord, I'm willing to do whatever you called me to do. But Matthias, you don't understand. I've got a job and I don't have enough time. You know that Muslims are compelled to go on a journey. A, pil a pilgrim's journey. Where they go to Mecca and they need to come back at least once in their life. Now, if it's true to the Muslims, how much not more is it true to the Christians? And I'm not talking on taking a holy vacation, saying I'm going to the holy city, Jerusalem. I'm talking about being relevant and saying, Lord, I'm willing to take some of my spare time, that which is mine, and give it to you. Why? Because we're going to roll back our sleeves. It's the season for us to be caught. The Bible says, if I come back, will I find them active in the vineyard? He's not saying, will I find them sowing? Sowing is just a portion of that which shows where your heart is. If, you, if we make church mainly about money, we miss the whole point. It's not about money. It's about you and your heart and your willingness and your desire to say, Lord, hear him, I use me. So I want to ask a simple question. Who feels convicted by the Holy Spirit that convicts you of truth and of righteousness that you need to be activated in this season? Is there anyone? Amen. I'm so glad. Then we, let's continue. So John 20, 19 says, That evening the disciples gathered together because they were afraid. The disciples were a... Can you see they were afraid? Remember, Jesus just got crucified. They were afraid of... Um, uh, the Jewish leaders, and they had locked the doors to the place where they met. But suddenly Jesus appeared amongst them and said, peace to you. So all of a sudden, Jesus just disappeared. He walks through the door, through the wall, and there he's in their midst, and he says to them, shalom, peace be to you. Do not be afraid. Do not be scared. I am in your midst. Amen. 
And listen now, but um, then he showed them the wounds on his hand and his side, and they were overjoyed to see the Lord with their own eyes. Remember now, early in the morning, the women came back with a report, and they said that Jesus has passed away, and he's stolen out of the grave. And all of a sudden, Jesus appears in their midst, alive, and he's showing them their wound, his wounds. Know that Jesus will have permanent marks in heaven? Who knows that? What's the other word for a permanent mark? <laughs> Jesus and I will have tattoos in heaven. No? You are out. No, you won't look like Jesus. That's fine. You, you look like the, the corgi. <laughs> the corgi. <laughs> That's okay. Listen here, peace be to you. And then he showed them his wounds in his hands and his side, and they were overjoyed and see the Lord with their own eyes. And Jesus repeated his greeting, peace to you. Interesting, something that he emphasizes is always important. I'm not here to judge you. You're not in trouble. No, you've not left me. You've not forsaken me. I'm not angry with you. I don't want you to feel condemned. Freda. Peace be to you. He's not there to tell them, where the heck were you guys? I was standing on that cross. You know what? You left me all alone, all by myself. He was not letting them know how much they have failed, how much they have withdrawn, how far they have fallen away, and how much they have to do to get recovered now. After I've spent all these years with you guys, you still persist with your nonsense. That's not what Jesus did. He was not convicting them of anything. All that he said to them, peace be to you. You are so, in where the, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There's a liberty. There's a peace among us. We get a conviction. You know what? If you are focusing on any area of hurt in your life, you have not come to the perfect peace that cast out all fear. Perfect love cast out all fear. If you are truly, fully loved, you'll never, ever have to fear. Fear is an absence of love in an area. If you're afraid that you disappoint the Lord, it's still an area that you're afraid of, and you need to say, Lord, you need to cast your perfect love on this area. Heal me. He wants to heal you. He's still the healer. He's still the restorer. He's still the lover of my soul. Just then the Father had sent me. Just as the Father had sent me, I'm now sending you. So I had a mandate. I came, and my mission was to die. And guess what? Your mission is now to go and do exactly what I've done. What have you seen me done? Well, he, this guy just conquered death. He lived to die, to stand up again. So what he's telling you is live with a conviction so that there's nothing that will keep you from completing the call of God on your life. That's what he's telling these disciples. I'm now sending you. Then talking, taking a deep breath, he blew on them. He said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. So I've heard many people preach on this and then they go stand in front of the church and they go like this. Receive the Holy Spirit. I don't believe they've, they've received the Holy Spirit here. Because the Bible says in John 16, which we just read earlier, that unless I go to the Father and I remain, this promise will not come down and remain with you. So they can't receive the Holy Spirit. What the Holy Spirit did do is he did this in the Old Testament. He came upon someone and it left them. His presence came on someone and he used them and then he, it withdrew. In the New Testament, it comes within the believer. And it is sealed so it stays. And it will never leave nor forsake you. It doesn't matter who you are, what you do, where you come from, what bad choices you're still going to make. It's going to remain. And it's going to convict you. And say to you, you are my beloved. Every time you take that substance to try and deal with something in life, it's going to say, I still love you. Why are you running to the wrong things? And you want to use more and get away more because you can't quiet the voice of the one that loves you most. That's the Jesus that I serve. And I send you to preach the forgiveness of sins and people sin will be forgiven. What is he sending us? To go and do exactly which irritated the Pharisees of the day because Jesus thought he was God or equal to God to forgive people's sin. And guess what he's telling everyone to go and do? Go and tell, let's, 
let's pee off all this religious oaks and tell people they are forgiven. And we take away any right that they have to stay in the position where they can stay. And you give them any, every right to exceed and to excel into the promises of God. What the mighty God we serve. The angels bow before them. They worship, they adore him. But if you don't proclaim the forgiveness of the sins, it will remain guilty. So he, what he is saying, if you keep quiet, if you stop preaching, guess what? People won't hear. And if they don't hear, they won't believe. Now what's the problem of the church? We fell silent. We fell silent. We are not opposing. We are not standing. We are scared to speak truth. We are scared to address certain things. I'm not scared to speak about homosexuality. I'm not scared to speak about um, a fornication. I speak the truth with people because the truth always sets people free. And then I leave the Holy Spirit to convict people and to work in their hearts to do after their will. Amen? Let's look at the next scripture. Now, now I'm going to prove to you that they have not received the Holy Spirit because they definitely don't have power yet. Let's look at it. And it says, on the eight, eight days later, remember Thomas was not with them. He was in the market and he came back and he said to the rest of the disciples, unless I put my hand in his, in, his, in his wounds and I put my hand in his side, I will not believe that he has stood up. He thought they were joking with him. Now that's not the kind of jokes that you should make. You don't tell them that Opa Koosie het opgestaan. Jy arma oma. Sy 80 jaar deurgesing nou hoor, so sit nou weer commitment. Goeie genichtig. Then eight days later, Thomas and all the others were in the house together, and even though all the doors were locked, has anything changed in these, their lives? They're still sitting be, behind locked doors. They are still scared as hell. Listen, yeah? And they are disbelieving. So eight days later, behind locked doors, Jesus suddenly stood before them, and he says the same again. Peace to you. Hey, blah. Peace. And he said, um, was it now? Verse 17. Then looking into Thomas's eyes, he said, put your finger here in the wounds of, in, in my hand. Here, put your hand in my wounded side and see for yourself, Thomas. Don't give in to your doubts any longer. Just believe. He's convicting him of truth. He's convicting him of his belief system. He's challenging and saying, and remember now, all these things that he preached beforehand, remember they were scattered. They were like sheep scattered abroad. They disbelieved in Jesus. When everything happened, they were, they were so discouraged with themselves because everyone ran away except John. None of them stayed. They called themselves friends. Peter, the night before, Lord, I'm willing to die for you. Made a confession. Can you imagine how guilty they feel? Now that's all right, dealing with the emotions once a person is dead. But imagine that very person comes back. You've just been part of the problem. And you're part of the reason because you didn't pitch up that he's dead. And all of a sudden he's back in the room and we were fighting two days earlier. Who's going to sit on his left and his right side. So maybe he's going to choose that guy now. You don't feel like a champion. They feel like failures. And they are disappointed and they're looking not to the promise, they're looking to their hurt. That's why Peter went back fishing. And Thomas didn't give in to your doubts any longer, just believe. Then the words spilled out of his heart, you are my Lord and you are my God. And Jesus responded, Thomas, now that you've seen me, you believe. But there are those who have never seen me with their eyes, but have believed in me with their hearts. And they will be blessed even more. You know what? I've always felt, I remember, I always quote this to people, they say, I just want to sit and talk to Jesus because everyone in church these days does it. I've never seen it. But I know I'm blessed even more because he said it. I don't need to sit with Jesus now because I'll spend eternities with him. But I'm still doing what he told me to do. You don't have to have this out of body experience to have an encounter with God. Once you've received his Holy Spirit and you've believed, you have no other choice than to surrender and say, Lord, I love you. I want to be with you. I want to live my life for you. I don't want to die for you. I want to live my life for you. 
I want to say to you, it's very easy to die for someone. It's very difficult to live for someone. I've got a baby girl, she's four years old, and we've been through hell and back to see that baby girl, to live for someone else. Not my will, then your will be done. That place is my heart. Acts 1 verse 3, after the suffering of his cross, Jesus appeared alive many times to the same apostles over the 40 days period. Why? For 40 days, he has had to preach and tell them and show them out of the previous, previous things. It's not your fault. Let me show you, this is what was said in the prophets. You are missing the whole idea. You are feeling condemned. You need to get a conviction. Now I want to say to you, you can't out of yourself get a conviction unless you have the Holy Spirit. That's what makes the church the most, the most dangerous um, organization or body in the world is the fact that we've got the Spirit of the living God within us. We should not be afraid. Not even in financial difficult times. We should not grow weary when things are not going our way. We should not grow weary when we get bad news. I've got cancer. Well, praise the Lord. Why? I'm going to see him earlier. Whatever. What can separate you from the love of God? No angel, no death, no sword, no famine. There's nothing in all creation that can separate you from the love of God. So God wants us to walk with conviction. I'm not scared of cancer. I'm not scared of getting anything in my life and I'm not arrogant about it. I'm saying it with a meekness. It's not that I want to have anything. I'm not scared of being stabbed, being sh shot, being killed because I live for at the mercy of one's hand and life and power is in his, is in his hand. You can't take my life. No one can take my life unless the Lord approves. And if he approves, I'm, I'm willing to go because then he'll take care of the rest. I was a child. My father passed away. I was 12 years old. They told everyone was crying. My whole family. What's, what are these kids going my, my grandma recently passed away. You know what she said? She said, he's going to jail. She, she sees the doors eating behind me. And she was not wrong. Her observation was not wrong. But no one told me the solution. All that I needed to hear was the gospel, the good news, and get accepted and loved into the kingdom. And it would have changed my whole life. Every one of us got a second chance. I don't care how holy your life has been. The Bible says we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I don't care if you've never used drugs, you're just as guilty as the guy that did. That's what it is. We all need Jesus. Many times, okay, so he came and he got, preached to them for 40 days. During these encounters, he taught them the truths of God's kingdom realm. The truth is always Jesus. He told them about what it is to be within him and he in you. And shared meals with them. It's very important that the church eat together. When we are not coming to church on the 18th and on Christmas, and you are local, please don't sit all by yourself. Come and have lunch with us. We're going to be a huge family gathering. I come back specifically and keep my vacation time out of that because I want to be part of the Ark family because they are our children. They are part of our body. So I want to spend time with people I love. Lekker Dennis. Huh? So you come come back, oh. I'm going to go with your lips. You don't know it. I'm going to go with my lips. I'm not going to go with your lips. I'm not going to go with your lips. But I can't. But I can't. Can. Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait here until you receive the gift I told you about. The gift the Father has promised. So I want to tell you, it's not to physically wait in Jerusalem. He says, just be in the place that you are and be diligent waiting. If you've received God, I want to say to you, if you are waiting upon the Lord, for those who wait upon the Lord, they regain their strength. They fly up on the wings of the edifice. They, they run and they do not get weary. I can tell you when I get weary, it's because I'm not spending time with the Lord. And unfortunately, that happens many times. I don't have to stand in front and make you believe that I'm the most holiest guy in the room. There's some weeks, I've been through a tough week. Been through hell and back. I don't come to church on the basis of how I feel. I come to church on the basis of what I believe he told me to do. I don't have to sit and fake it. Who's ever been, well, let me not go there. <laughs> you don't want to be in a marriage and you're faking it. Okay? 
and shared meals with them, Jesus instructed them, don't leave Jerusalem. Okay, verse 5. For John baptized you with water, but in a few days from now, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. What I tried to prove is when Jesus blew on them in Acts, in John 20, no one received the promise of the Holy Spirit. It was a physical manifestation that he did. Because exactly what he did, the blowing was going to happen through the house now. They're going to have the tongues of fire, and I'm going to show it to you right now. The problem is that we've got all this preaching that, go, that goes around where we make people feel good and you give them this power hypes because we make it all about you, your encounter, how much you will be enabled. No, you are called for one thing, to live for God, to do what God has called you to say, to live a life worthy of his death. Not to become famous. It's not so that you'll be famous. I want to say to you, following the promise of the Lord over your life will hardly bring you fame. If you are famous for, for preaching the gospel, I want to say to you, Jesus was not famous. He was hated. He was persecuted. He was killed by his very own people. They held him king the one week and the next week they persecuted him. It's not something, it's not a glory hype. Acts 2 verse 1. And on the day of Pentecost, while being... F um, was being fulfilled, all the disciples were gathered in one place. Suddenly they heard the sound of a violent blast of wind, a mighty rushing wind, your Bibles will say, into the house from out of the heaven realm. I think God was sitting, Jesus was thinking, he was going like this. <sighs> Remember when he was on the sea? The, the, you know that the word for wind is spirit as well? When Jesus was in the, on the sea, he calmed the spirit. So many people will say, oh, it's, you know, it was obviously, it was, a, it was there for destruction. Who sent the whale? Who sent the storm in Jonah, Jonah's story? God. I believe God. So people will make statements like, no, God doesn't send storms. I think God used every storm. I think sometimes storms is the only reason why we get to our final destination. Because many times we don't have the power nor the might. And it's just the wind blowing us on. It's from spirit and from glory to glory. Amen. Suddenly they heard the sound of a violent blast of wind rushing through the house from out the heavenly realm. And the roar of the wind was so overpowering it was all, um, was all anyone could bear. Then all at once a pillar of fire appeared before their eyes. Seems like in the Old Testament, a pillar of fire. And it separated into tongues of fire that engulfed each one of them. So all of a sudden, you get this, you see me there, and I'm standing with this fiery tongue on the side of my head. All of them. Not only the 12 or the three that was closest to Jesus, the whole body joined together working as one. You know what's the interesting thing when God comes into the house? He fills everyone. God's not only good to the guy on your left, he's good to you as well. He wants you to succeed. His heart is for you, not against you. And listen here, and they were awful and equipped with the Holy Spirit and were inspired to speak in tongues, empowered by the Spirit to speak in a language that never learned. So this is, there's three different types of tongues. The one tongue is where you edify yourself. The Bible says your mind is unfruitful. I'm not going to go into the next week. I'm going to preach on that. You can please get on the piano if you don't mind. And it would, what we see is this three, on the three tongues, the one tongue was a tongue where you speak like, say, Sutu of Kozuma, if I'm going to do that, now I'm going to, I can't fluke in it. <laughs> so, I can be kiporogies fluke and be zulu fluke and this is all that I've heard. So, unfortunately, I'm not going to try and speak that, but it was literally speaking in Saubona Kunjani, Sikona Ge, or whatever. And they were having this dialogue and they didn't know what they were saying. And they were preaching the gospel of the good news. So that it would edify someone else who would hear and they would all of a sudden preach the good news of Jesus. So imagine the Holy Spirit comes on the 120 of us sitting here this morning. And this fiery tongue becomes on you. And all of a sudden, because of the experience you have with God, you can't keep silent. And you roll back your sleeves and you go into the marketplace. And when Peter, scared, locking himself up all the time, all of a sudden, sudden walk into a crowd and he starts preaching and 3,000 people give their life to the Lord. That is empowering. When we understand 
that it was a guy that would not even speak out when Jesus was being killed. And all of a sudden, he's got the strength to roar like a lion. Because now he is convicted of the truth. He's not scared of death. He's not confronted. He's not comparing himself to anyone. He's not looking for a position. He just wants to be one of God's disciples. He wants to be the one saying, Lord, hear him. I please send me. He wants to stand up and say, Lord, in all creation, use my voice. Thank you, Father, that you have blessed me and that you've kept me alive. And now that I've had this manifestation of the Spirit within me, I can't keep quiet. So I'm just going to keep on prophesying and speaking. And I'm going to spend time and be aware of my daddy because he loves me. And all of a sudden he realized the, the intimacy, what Jesus had with the Father. And he's walking around with a conviction that I am beloved. All of a sudden, he doesn't label himself as the fisherman and the one that disappointed Jesus and left him alone at the cross and, and disappointed him by not pitching and this failure. And all of a sudden, he's so content with being just Peter. And now I can speak because I'm beloved. He becomes the first church father. Forty years later, he gets crucified. As they are nailing him to the cross, he says, please, don't leave me in this position. I can't die as my Lord. Put me upside down. We call the upside down cross the Satanist cross. I want to tell you it's the cross of St. Peter. I'm, I see nothing. People will ask me, but what if you raise your hand, you've got an upside down cross. No, it's the Peter's cross. It's the cross that reminds me that I'm not worthy to die this way. You know what? The conviction that came to their heart with joy they took all suffering and endured all kinds of hardships because they said I found him and I experienced what he had with my dad and I don't need to pretend and do things that other people might like me but I can move into his presence and know that he has approved of me before I've begun this morning it's not a power hype it's not to lay down on the ground it's to become aware of what we already have as I look all over the room, I know most of you. I know you found the one, the lover of your soul. But unless you become aware of the value that he places on you and what he has done for you, you will always compromise and try and please him. I don't try and please God anymore. I just try and be with God. I just try and say, Lord, these days that I stand up this week, I tell you, I think I had Bible study twice, the whole week. Being a pastor, it's an indictment. I feel that stuff wants to condemn me because I want to perform so that I feel approved of God. You know what the Lord said to me? As I was driving, I wasn't even listening to gospel songs. He played this love song over the radio. I felt so aware of him. I had a more encounter with God on a world song where he's singing how much he loves me. I'm riding on my own, weeping, just saying, Lord, thank you for this. I feel blessed. Thank you that you don't. I don't need to be super spiritual. I tell you, I had an eye on Jesus on rock set all before. Okay. Ah, hallelujah. Now I'm crying. I'm concluding with my father-in-law's favorite scripture. Don't be obsessed with money. But live content with what you have. For you always have God's presence. For He hasn't promised you, I will never leave you alone. Never. And I will not loosen my grip on your life. So we can say with this great confidence, I know that the Lord is for me. That I will never be afraid of what people may do to me. I want to say to you that if you walk with a conviction, you think that God loves you because of what you have, because of your finances, then you are misinformed of who the person of Jesus really is. If you are weighing yourself up to your sister, and you always feel insecure towards your sister, your sister-in-law, be because of the way that God is treating them and what God has graciously given upon their lives, Many times the people that went through the greatest suffering was used the most in the Bible. Joseph did not have this passionate, great life. But still God used him and he fulfilled his purpose. And at the end of his life, he made the, his brothers promise 
that they will not leave his bones be behind because he believed in a city that was not orchestrated by man and it was not built by the hands of man I want you this morning if you just tear off the, bot, the, the, the first part of your glass there's a piece of bread and um, this morning I want you to understand the Bible says that uh, and I want to clarify something because we don't, many people say that I don't want to use communion because I've got sin nonsense then you use it the more the Bible says the only reason why you should, should not use this is when you're going to eat it and you don't believe that Jesus is the Savior because then you eat yourself a conviction of yourself that you are guilty because you've heard about him and you will become sick okay so if you're not a believer please don't partake of the of the um, body of Christ if you've given your heart to Jesus doesn't matter what you have in your life what you're struggling with how you fight with your wife in the car you're having this to celebrate him because this is what makes us whole okay so we take this morning the body of Christ the bread that his body was bruised and crushed for our sake as we eat this bread this morning we eat wholeness over ourselves over our bodies over our, over our sickness over our financial circumstances over our, our troubles in our families because we all have that am i right it's not only me we have opposition and this morning you take the bread knowing that his body was bruised for you you say thank you lord you deal with it if you are praying for your family members your children your loved ones those who are still broken those who are still on the street who's not where you are now they are still falling into wrong relationships you eat this and you keep them in mind and you bring them in front of the lord because he is faithful to work them let's eat the body of jesus thank you lord that there's wholeness coming in our in our bodies in our hearts the bible says that the cup this is the cup of the new testament it's not basically supposed to be done individually it's supposed to be a big cup where we all participate of like in biblical times but we have grown scared of viruses and of different nonsense it's supposed to be a cup which unifies us the cup shows the unity of the church the reason why we have the cup is to remind ourselves that everything in our lives has been paid for that there's nothing outstanding on your account you can never walk around with a conviction that I'm still indebted to God. I want to say to you, Jesus paid it all. If the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. I want you to celebrate the freeness of God. This is the cup that you drink. This is the cup that tells you that you are saved and you will be in heaven. We will walk on streets of gold. We will celebrate His glory because we have believed in the only Son of God. Let's have the cup of Jesus. every drop of blood that was spilled the world the bible says if it was only for you you would have done it and as you drink this today and you had this communion all areas of lack you say lord i give it to you and i walk with a conviction so if you're going through a hard time do it in praise are we right to that let's just all stand place your hand on your left chest on your heart not on your breast on your chest <laughs> i've got that one wrong before this time i got it right <laughs> okay on your heart put place your hand on your heart and just make the following declaration lord jesus thank you that my heart is full of you i hunger for you lord work in my heart to do after your will lord jesus i'm willing to surrender i ask father that you will guide me through your spirit in this season help me lord that i will be part of the solution help me lord that i'll be able to roll back my sleeves i'm convicted of righteousness because of the spirit that is sealed within me in jesus mighty name